In today's video, we're going to talk about five tax strategies that can be used to cut your tax bill in a big way. But we're not going to focus on the upside of using these strategies, but rather talk through a few examples where these tax strategies can be used in the wrong way and actually hurt your financial situation. Let's get into it. First, let's talk about Roth conversions. Roth conversions have gotten incredibly popular in the last decade as many retirees are seeing big tax liabilities come down the road due to things like required minimum distributions. You can see an example of this RMD issue on the screen. This example retiree before RMDs is seeing the majority of their income taxed on the 22% bracket. Once RMDs begin, they are immediately pushed into the 33% bracket and will stay there for the remainder of their retirement. So converting portions of their IRAs into Roth will lead to big tax savings. But here are two ways that Roth conversions can actually hurt your situation. The first is, confer <clears throat> the first is converting too aggressively. On the screen, I have a number of conversion strategies like maxing out certain brackets. On the x-axis is how much time you might potentially spend in retirement. The y-axis is the after-tax improvement from said Roth conversion strategy. You can see that most strategies deliver some tax benefit of differing degrees, all except one that is, and that would be maxing out the 35% bracket. It's important to understand as you perform Roth conversions, you can be too aggressive. The value of a Roth conversion comes down to the rates that you pay. You are trying to avoid paying higher rates down the road, but if you pay a very high rate right now to avoid high rates in the future, well, then the value of a Roth conversion is diminished or completely eliminated. This is why converting everything in one or two years almost never makes sense. Your goal is to smooth out your tax liability and maintain the lowest tax rates throughout your retirement that are possible. This means that a multi-year approach that's converting at reasonable rates is often the best approach. Another problem in Roth converting for most people is when they convert all of their IRAs. We have a progressive tax system where the more income you show, the higher rate you will pay on that income. Let's say that you are maxing out the 24% bracket and you happen to convert all of your IRAs. Well, now you just eliminated the potential of withdrawing IRA income in the 0% bracket underneath the standard deduction, the 10% and the 12% bracket. Paying 24% to avoid 10% isn't going to make sense. And so most retirees will find that going into their RMD years with a very manageable IRA balance is often optimal. Most retirees don't mind a small $10,000 RMD they just don't want a $100,000 RMD. In large part, you can control this via your Roth conversion strategy. Let's now move on to talking about the ever popular backdoor Roth strategy. For those that don't know, a backdoor Roth allows you to contribute to a Roth IRA even if you are over the income limit for Roth contribution. It's a loophole of sorts. Here's how it works. You make a non-deductible contribution to a traditional IRA. Non-deductible basically means that you don't take the tax deduction for your contribution. You contribute with after-tax dollars. A second after that contribution, you convert that contribution to Roth. Because it's after-tax dollars, you would owe no taxes on this conversion. Voila, you basically made a Roth contribution, even if you made too much income to actually make a Roth contribution. For 2024, here are the income limits for Roth contribution. Contribution phases out completely at $161,000 of modified adjusted gross income for single filers and $240,000 for married filers. For the most part, unless your income is made up of a lot of long-term capital gains or dividend income, at these income levels, these tax filers are going to be within the 24% bracket. A lot of times I see workers use this backdoor strategy in the 32% and 35% brackets as they aren't able to easily contribute to Roth outside of their Roth 401k. But here's the problem with backdoor Roths. As we talked about with Roth conversions, the tax logic around whether a backdoor Roth makes sense comes down to the rate you are paying on that contribution versus the rate you are paying or rather avoiding on withdrawing that income in retirement. If you are paying 15% as a tax rate on the contribution and you're paying the exact same rate on withdrawal in retirement, then it doesn't matter whether you saved in tax deferred accounts or Roth accounts, whether you did a Roth conversion or not. If the growth path was the same, you are going to have the same ending after tax balance. This is the commutative property of multiplication. If you are paying a 24% tax rate on contribution, but you avoid 30% in retirement, then Roth or a backdoor Roth will make sense. If you're paying 24% on contribution, but would be paying 22% in retirement when you withdraw, 
then you certainly want to defer taxes into the future. It all comes down to the rates. Well, the problem with a backdoor Roth is by choosing this strategy, you are often paying higher rates by definition. Now, some workers should be comfortable with paying 24% on a backdoor Roth contribution. But when you start moving into the 32% and 35% brackets, many will find this backdoor Roth no longer makes the most sense. Then beyond this, there's also a pro rata rule that you must consider. Many investors don't think about this until it's too late. When you perform a backdoor Roth outside of a 401k, when you go to perform that Roth conversions, your IRAs, all of your IRAs together will be aggregated. In this example on the screen, this person makes a $5,500 non-deductible contribution with the intent of doing that backdoor Roth. But they also have $200,000 of traditional IRA assets in addition to this non-deductible contribution. When they go to perform that $5,500 backdoor Roth conversion, they don't just get to isolate that $5,500. Rather, they have to aggregate everything together and that conversion is done on a pro rata basis. This means that only 2.7% of their IRAs are non-deductible, so only 2.7% of their conversion will be tax-free. Over 97% of their conversion will be converting traditional IRA assets, which means they will owe a tax liability on that portion of conversion. So the backdoor Roth is not really being accomplished here. And the only way to convert the full non-deductible portion would be to convert all of their IRA assets, which is probably unwise given their situation. In addition, any future earnings from that non-deductible contribution will be traditional IRA earnings. So this person just forced themselves into a whole lot of complexity by trying to use this backdoor Roth. And they probably contributed on that non-deductible contribution at some fairly high rates as well. So don't make these common backdoor Roth mistakes. Next, we'll talk about tax loss harvesting. This is a powerful strategy that some research from robo-advisors like Betterment suggests that it can increase your after-tax returns by as much as 0.7% per year. Let's first give an example of how this strategy would work in practical terms. This is only valid, by the way, for taxable accounts. At the beginning of 2022, investor John puts $10,000 in a growth ETF. Now, 2022 was a rough year for growth, so by June, this position was down 25% or $2,500. Now, John chooses to tax loss harvest this position, meaning that he's going to sell that VUG position. At the same time, he's going to buy back another growth ETF that is dissimilar enough in the eyes of the IRS, but will perform very similar in practical terms. By doing so, he captures a $2,500 loss he can use to offset his income at, in this case, a 24% tax rate. One year later, his position, let's say, recovers, and he sells it at this point in time. He pays long-term capital gains rates and receives a tax advantage from basically playing the tax tables. So tax loss harvesting is valued the highest when you are able to play these bracket games, basically emptying out taxable income at higher rates and recapturing it at lower rates. If you can offset at 22% and 24% and later recapture at 15%, well, now you have a tax benefit. Losses can also be used intra-year to offset gains in other categories. For instance, let's say you have $10,000 of short-term capital gains and also $10,000 of long-term losses. Well, the $10,000 of gains will offset the $10,000 of losses, and the same principle applies because short-term gains are taxed at those higher rates. But where can tax loss harvesting go awry? In my professional opinion, I think tax loss harvesting individual stocks is very difficult. This goes in the face of a lot of advice in this industry. Many advisors recommend using individual stocks because you have more opportunities to tax loss harvest. 30 stocks versus, let's say, 5 ETFs likely gives you more losses on an annual basis. And this is likely true, but in tax planning, we can't let the tax tail wag the dog. First and foremost, we have to care about the underlying performance of what we are tax loss harvesting or not tax loss harvesting. And there are wash sale rules that make tax loss harvesting individual securities very risky in my opinion. Let's say that you own Microsoft stock and it happens to be down $20,000. Okay, great, tax loss harvest it and let's buy Apple as a replacement because they're somewhat related. Well, somewhat related and highly correlated are two completely different things when we talk about investing. Say Microsoft recovers and Apple remains unchanged. This is a completely realistic scenario. Now, you took a tax loss and also a performance loss on Microsoft but you weren't able to recapture that performance loss. Using ETFs, we can more closely match performance while still avoiding those wash sale rules. 
For instance, a large cap growth ETF can likely be changed out for another large cap growth ETF with no issues from the IRS if you are careful. I'll link to a video in the upper right hand corner that talks about some principles for how to make sure they don't overlap and hit those wash sale rules. But the point being, these two large cap growth ETFs will be much more correlated than Apple and Microsoft. Second, you can also tax loss harvest at the wrong times. This is less prevalent, but nonetheless a risk. Say a married couple is currently showing $15,000 of taxable income. Should they tax loss harvest? Well, probably not because instead they should probably tax gain harvest. If you look at the 2024 capital gain brackets, they have about $79,000 worth of room where they could harvest additional capital gains and pay a 0% tax rate on those capital gains and basically reset their cost basis. If they tax loss harvested, they're likely gaining a fraction of that tax benefit. Second, let's say a single filer tax loss harvested their entire account in December of 2022 and then reinvested it. Now they need income in June of 2023. Well, what's the problem here? Well, it might be great that they tax loss harvested, but now they sit in June with a bunch of gains on their positions. And if they sell those positions, they're going to be taxed at short-term capital gain rates because they haven't held for at least one year. They likely reverse all of the benefits of what they had previously tax loss harvested. Next, let's talk about problems with planning for a step up in basis as you legacy plan for the next generation. Step up in basis is an amazing tax benefit when legacy planning. Here we have retiree Steve who is 72 years old. Now, he has owned IBM stock for decades and because of this, has about a $410,000 capital gain if he were to sell IBM right now. But here's the thing, if Steve holds on to IBM when he passes away, Steve's heirs will receive a step up in basis and completely wipe out that capital gain tax bill for his heirs. This would generate tens of thousands in taxes saved. And so, so many people in Steve's position plan to hold on to that stock indefinitely. But here's the problem. Once again, we cannot let the tax tail wag the dog. Now, let me first asterisk this by saying I have no idea how IBM will perform in the future. And this is not advice relative to IBM itself. But in general, we would expect a diversified stock portfolio to outperform a single stock position on average. Although it will cause a tax hit now, Steve might want to consider exiting some IBM and reinvesting in a more diversified portfolio. In investing, we need to not only consider the absolute costs, but also opportunity costs. Although a tax hit today hurts, better performance can more than overcome that tax hit. Here's a comparison of IBM to a total stock market index since 2010. The index outperformed IBM by basically double the growth rate. So 10 years ago, with obviously with hindsight bias, he should have exited that highly appreciated position and the performance would have more than dwarfed the tax hit. Now again, we have no idea what the future holds. I'm not trying to use this hindsight bias to uh, make a case here. So I caution against betting too much on performance predictions. But in general, a more diversified portfolio offers a higher expected growth rate than a single stock position. So my point here is don't hold on to poor assets just because of a step up in basis that might happen when you pass away. For one, we don't know when you're going to pass away. If you were going to pass away in a year, uh, obviously, you know, the math might change and whatnot. But we need to consider opportunity costs while you're still alive. And in certain cases, the opportunity costs can more than encompass the tax costs of exiting that given position. Then finally, we're going to discuss another legacy tax saving strategy, trusts. Now, investors that have built large nest eggs that they won't be able to draw down during their life might want their assets going to the next generation. But in some cases, they might be afraid that their heirs are going to do financially dumb things with that money, either because of age, outside influence, or maybe they just aren't great with money at this point in time. Well, here would be an example. You might have a young son that is too focused on impressing others and living the fast life. The last thing you want to do is give that child a million dollars free and clear and then have them blow it all at once on a fancy car, expensive trips, and other people. A trust can allow you to give to the next generation in defined terms. Rather than a million dollars all at once, maybe they only get $30,000 per year. It's enough to make life easier for them, but probably still forces them to create their own spot in life. The reason this can be a great tax savings tool is because spending a million dollars at once probably is gonna cause some pretty poor tax consequences. 
let alone what that money could otherwise turn into with prudent investing and prudent spending. But here's where this tax strategy can go awry. Trust tax rates are extremely high, extremely fast. Generally speaking, when income is directly passed to an heir, that pass-through income is taxed at the heir's tax rate. But if that trust retains income, in this example, $60,000 of additional income, then the trust owes taxes. Pretty quickly, that trust would be taxed at 37%. And so you might be setting up a trust to save on taxes and force prudent money management. But by doing so, you may have unintended consequences of forcing that money into the higher tax rates you are trying to avoid. Now, there are a lot of ways this trust can be set up to avoid this. But recently, I met with a few retirees that had this set up and had never thought about the tax consequences of this trust. They viewed it as a tax savings device, but never thought about the tax consequences of trusts. And so keep in mind that with every tax savings strategy, there is a sweet spot. A hammer can be a great tool, unless you need to fix a vase, then a hammer is largely useless and you're probably better off with glue. Knowing when and how to use a strategy correctly is the whole game when we talk about tax planning. And speaking of taxes, if you want to learn more about retirement's most common tax hurdle, click here. You'll learn how tax rates can rise 50 to 85% in retirement if you're not careful. Click here to learn more and always remember, you don't need more money, you need a better plan. Thanks for watching.